why resilience must be assessed, not measured. Alfred Crosby gave us a wonderful book called The Measure of Reality. He took a historical look at this period before the Industrial Revolution in which scientists beginning in Italy and moving out across Europe were establishing norms of quantification. It's these practices, whether it's double entry bookkeeping or measuring the movement of the planets about the sun, that gave us a realistic view of reality that could produce models that result in reliable predictions, of whether it's a lunar eclipse or whether it's uh, something in manufacturing and technology. What Crosby's thesis advanced was the idea that measuring reality is what gave, what enabled the enlightenment and the scientific and industrial revolution that followed. Sure enough, it was Galileo who said, measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not. This idea of measurement and quantification was necessary for the revolution that Galileo helped usher in with his methods of building models that make predictions and can be empirically falsified. So I'm going to start today with competing epigraphs, although I don't really know who, who gave us these quotes. They're going to represent for us two different views of measurement and quantification. And then I'm going to make the argument why resilience must be assessed, described, understood, but not measured. The first of these is familiar to engineers and physical scientists everywhere. What gets measured? gets managed. It is the bureaucracies of the Industrial Revolution, the organizations in which we're embedded, whether it's our university or our corporation, that insists upon measurement and management. Certainly the Six Sigma approach to quality emphasizes measurement. Certainly the forms that we fill out and the spreadsheets that we trade, they're all about measuring and managing. And there's a good reason for it. Because when we're measuring and managing, we can make things more efficient. It is this efficiency that makes us rich. It is efficiency that allows us to reduce costs, reduce prices, increase the size of the market, capture economies of scale. It is efficiency on which the Industrial Revolution was founded. The other epigraph. Not everything that matters can be measured. And not everything that can be measured matters. If it is what measured gets managed, but not everything that is worth managing gets measured, then how are we to reconcile our systems of measurement and quantification that would leave out important things? Well, what are some of those important things? Perhaps it's something like culture. Perhaps it's something like creativity. Perhaps it's something like adaptability. And it is this adaptability that is the critical concept essential to resilience. So we're going to get into adaptability in a little more detail. Whereas it's efficiency that makes us rich, it is adaptability that keeps us alive. And how do we know what our adaptability is? The only way to know is to test it because measurement happens on the spreadsheet when we're working with nouns. Adaptability happens in action when we're working with verbs. There is no adaptability without action. And the difficult thing about verbs is they cannot be counted in the same way that nouns can. It's often said that Charles Darwin gave us the concept. Charles Darwin taught us survival of the fittest. 
But it turns out that Darwin never said that. Uh, survival of the fittest was a contemporary of Darwin's who was paraphrasing or reviewing his book, um, Origin of Species. What Darwin actually said was survival of the most adaptive. Survival and resilience is about survival. Survival is found not in the nouns, but in the verbs. Nouns over here, they might relate to the fittest. What have you got? What do you have? And verbs are related to what do you do? So we're going to go into this in a little bit more detail. And to do it, we are going to start with a familiar concept. We're going to start with something that we know better than resilience. And that something is risk. Risk is a funny word in the English language because it can be used both as a noun and as a verb. And historically, both uses existed in the English language for a long time with the noun form dominating the risk form. But certainly, we understand the risk form. We say, um, well, should I risk it? We can understand the noun form of risk as something like a hazard or a hazard times a probability. And these equations all exist and they're generally familiar to us. But the verb form now exists in an extreme minority. And we have to be reminded that risk is also a verb. It was somewhere around 1970 when the noun form of risk really took off. And the verb form in the use in the printed English language remained static. So I call this the objectification of risk. It was after 1970 that in science and engineering in particular, risk became understood more and more as a noun and less and less as a verb. So this is our familiar concept. And often when we're talking about resilience, we devolve into the familiar. We wind up having discussions that are really about risk. We don't need a new word. We don't need the word resilience if what we really want to talk about is risk. So it's important for us to differentiate risk from resilience. In risk, the noun form dominates. And the weird thing about resilience is we think of resilience as a noun as well. But to think of resilience as something that you have rather than something as you do misses the essential aspect of resilience. It is not the emergency backup generator that makes your system resilient. It is your ability to activate the generator. It is not your centralized uh, command system that makes your system resilient. It is your capacity to change the command system from centralized to decentralized, back and forth. Resilience is found in the adaptations, not in the objects. And this is why resilience must be assessed, not measured. Because measurement is for nouns, and resilience is in action. We're going to try and understand this in a little bit more detail and use an example of how to assess. There are lots of ways that we can assess the nouns. We go around and we count all the generators. We think about the system properties. We write down the nouns. We report them on the form in the spreadsheet. But how shall we reveal the resilience in action? There are several ways. The simplest of these is the model. We build a mathematical model of a system. We have all the influences and the causes and effects, and then we strain the model. We watch the model work in action. And as the model is working, we understand the changes that propagate through the model. We can observe the verbs. This is what I call assessment. Because we cannot count verbs, we cannot measure them, but we can describe what happens when we observe the verb in action. More complex than a model is a simulation. And you could ask, well, sort of, uh, what's the difference? When the model is working, the model can work independently on the computer, in the spreadsheet, on the calculator. But as we bring in a simulation, 
we introduce the less predictable human component. There is a difference between the model of the plane and the simulation that includes the pilot. So when we're training pilots to adapt to surprising situations, we use flight simulators, not just models. Slightly more complex than simulation is a game. And the difference between the simulation and the game is that the game adds a motivational. It adds a, an emotional component. If you remember the movie about Sully who ditched his plane in the Hudson River, when the investigators ran the simulation, sure enough, the pilots in the flight simulator were able to land their crippled plane at Teterboro. But when you add the emotional component, they can't make it to Teterboro because when, they, um, when they're faced with the real live situation, there is uncertainty and there is delay. There is the fear and anxiety of the consequences of failing to make it to Teterboro. In a game, we add an emotional component that adds this additional layer of complexity. So when we're trying to assess resilience, when we're trying to observe the verbs, so far we have the model that sort of runs by itself. We have the simulation in which people are interacting with the model and we have the game in which people have an incentive structure or a motivation or an emotional component that has the additional complexity. Finally, we get to a rehearsal. And a rehearsal, it still could be in the context of the game or the simulation, but the rehearsal typically happens in a live full-scale event. We are going to practice ditching our plane in the Hudson River. We're going to war game it. We're going to have blue versus red, and we're going to use real equipment and real tanks and the real planes. The rehearsal is a larger, more complex scale than the game because it is at a more specific, a less abstract representation of what we're trying to observe. And then finally, there is the event. When the Twin Towers were attacked by hijacked planes. We were no longer at a rehearsal or a game. It was a real event. And we can learn a lot by watching the verbs in action in the real event, but certainly real events are more complex than rehearsals. Rehearsals are more complex than games. Games are more complex than simulations. Simulations are more complex than models. So complexity goes up as we progress through these different experimental contexts for observing resilience. What about expense? Well, models are cheap compared to simulations. As we go up and to the right, as we make more complex, the expense of the investigation goes up. And it's not just the funding. To do a model, you must develop the model. But to do a simulation or a game, you have to have the participation of the human actors. So not only does the complexity go up, but the investment increases. At the level of the rehearsal, we need the full-scale equipment. We've now, and we're not just asking people to participate. People are actively engaged. And the difficult thing about the event is not just staging the event, but the consequences of the event, repairing all the damage. The events are often unplanned and so expensive that the consequences exist outside the event itself. And this is why we seek to model, simulate, gamify or, or investigate with games and rehearse so that we can avoid the complexity and the expense and the consequences of the event. There is an important thing to point out about these settings under which we assess resilience rather than measure it. As we move towards the right, towards the more complex, our relationship with surprise and uncertainty evolves. In the model, we have what I would call normal variation. Consider a deck of cards. You're going to draw a card. There are only four suits, hearts, spades, diamonds, clubs. It's uncertain, but it's not ambiguous. You know that you will draw one of these suits. You know there are 52 cards, maybe plus a joker in the deck. And the kind of uncertainty that you face is normal variation. But as we move out in complexity, in these contexts in which we're trying to assess the verbs of resilience, we move from normal variation to situational surprise. In situational surprise, we will find the low probability events. Although we recognize them as possible, we didn't know that 
that they would come up in a certain context because they're so unlikely. These sort of long tail events. We're well, we're surprised. You buy a lottery ticket and you win. That's situational surprise. It's not likely. You weren't predicting that you win, but it happens. And in, in the case of winning the lottery, perhaps that's very pleasant. But suppose you won the lottery and you never bought a ticket. That's what we call fundamental surprise. Fundamental surprise happens when we are confronted with situations that we thought were impossible. So in these different settings in which we want to observe the verbs of resilience in action, at the model and the simulation, we can investigate normal variation, we can investigate situational surprise, but we are unlikely to discover those fundamental surprises that open our eyes, that make us aware of new possibilities we thought never existed. To do that, we must rehearse or experience events because it is in the most complex context in which the fundamental surprise can be revealed. These are the situations, the context in which we can observe resilience in action. But it doesn't tell us what to look for. For that, we're going to have to go to my last slide. There are four processes. We will call these four verbs, four things that we should be looking for. Sensing, anticipating, adapting, and learning. These are important in risk management and they're important in resilience as well. So I'm going to walk you through what to look for when you are assessing the verbs of resilience, knowing that these are the verbs to be paying attention to. Certainly, there are quantitative approaches uh, for sensing, um, information analytics, uh, quantifying our world with sensors, harvesting data from the world to try and keep track of the sense uh, or keep track of the state of reality in which we live. But there are also qualitative markers. And the qualitative are how we do assessment rather than measurement. The anecdotes, the outliers, the narrative. The things that people are telling us in their stories, they are also important to our sensing. When we hear stories that lie outside our sensor network, these are exactly the kinds of things that might prepare us for the situational or the fundamental surprise. Anticipating. When we're anticipating, we're no longer thinking about this current state that we can sense. We have to imagine future states that don't yet exist. And it's in our imagining the future states that we prepare for them. Certainly, risk does anticipating. It does through probability and forecasting and optimality. optimality. Uh, that is planning for the minimum hazard times probability scenarios and attempting to steer the future towards those. But resilience is different. Resilience doesn't ask about probability. Resilience is trying to examine possibility. Resilience doesn't do forecasting. It does anticipating. And resilience is not about optimality. Resilience is about maximizing optionality. How do I act now so as to not constrain, to give myself maximum adaptive capacity in the future? Adapting. We often think about adapting in the technological sense. Operations research gives us design variables and constraints, and we can move these around in a way that allows our system to adapt. But I'm going to ask you to think about adaptation in this more qualitative sense, the organizational. To be resilient, our organization must be able to adapt who has access to what information. We have to change access to information according to the circumstances. We have to change allocation of decision rights, whether they should be centralized or distributed. Resilience is found in neither of these. It is found in the ability to change between them. We have to change our patterns of interaction. It may be that our organization is a hierarchical tree-like structure, and what we really need for a certain situation is a web. Well, resilience is neither found in the starfish nor the spider. It is found in our capacity to toggle between the two. And resilience insists that we are able to change our meaning making of the situation. Lastly, there is learning. And there are several different ways that we learn through research, education, training, and development, more complex ways of knowing. This is the last that I want to emphasize. Because to be resilient, we must expand our way of understanding the world from that which must be measured to that which can be assessed.